to audience, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just leave the uh, your question in the chat box. So Dr. Uh, Simonet will address your question during the presentation or after the presentation. Thank yeah, you. I will not be checking chat okay. <laughs> during presentation. That's impossible. I found out already. Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. So as we discussed before we started, I visited uh, Honolulu already uh, four times in the past, uh, first time in 2003, and I have given there uh, four Hydra's workshops actually. So hopefully some of you are familiar with the program uh, by, by now. Uh, what I want to do basically is to give a um, main overview of the software and its capabilities rather than going into particular studies. And hopefully you will find some, some part of it which might be useful in your research or in, in your applications. Uh, before I start, I would like to mention some of the, my colleagues with whom I'm working closely on de developing these uh, pieces of software. So that would be, first of all, Rien van Genuchten, Diedrich Jacques, Mirek Schena, and the Giuseppe Brunetti. And I will have a slide about each of them. As you can see from my name, um, I, 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 I know all these strange signs. So I'm clearly not from the United States. I came to the United States about 30 years ago. And I got all my degrees in Czechoslovakia, which uh, used to be a country. It's not a country anymore. And I will have a slide which shows you that as well. OK, well, let's see. OK, so, so first of all, uh, my mentor and my first boss in the United States was Rien van Genuchten. And um, he, I, I'm pretty sure if you work in videos on hydrology, you must uh, have heard his name. He, he would be, or I consider him a founding father of the modern soul physics because he came up with the most uh, fundamental blocks of the soul physics from the retention curve, from flow models, from transport models, mobile, immobile water concepts and all these things. So, so he's, said, he's also one of the most widely, not one of the most, he's the most widely cited scientist in, in hydrology. And so I got a big break when I came to the United States that I was working with him. Uh, the second most important person in uh, my s scientific uh, life is uh, Miroslav Shena. He's a mathematician. He's my best friend already since uh, high school. And with him, we are developing graphical user interfaces for the Hydra's models. He's a uh, mathematician, as I said. He, he got PhD in supersonic flow, so something very different from what we do, much faster, obviously, uh, but it's also flow. And so, so some of the applications or some of the tools we, we need, such as merge generation and stuff, are similar for his application and mine. And so that's why we got together and started developing these, these, these tools together. And then finally, I worked for about 20 years already with Diedrich Jacques, who is, uh, uh, working in the, at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center. And with him, we are working on these various biogeochemical applications where we try to account for much more complex uh, reactions and processes than what the standard hydrous model can, can do. Okay, so just about the background. So I, I mentioned I'm from Czechoslovakia. Uh, let me get the pointer. Okay, so Czechoslovakia used to be this thing here, right, this long, so that used to be one country. We split in 1992 into two countries, in Czechia and Slovakia, uh, peacefully. And uh, so, so now Czechia is quite small country, it has only 10, mil 10 million people, but we still made a quite big impact on the world, mainly by inventing the technology for beer. So 90, 70% of all the beer made in the world is now made using this Pilsner technology, which is the city in the Western Bohemia. And we made also some impact in the sports. We were twice in the final at the World Cup, seven times world champions in ice hockey. So this thing, we had to beat Canada many times and Olympic winners, etc. 
a very important part for the country is human rights. And so we, we are in constant fights with the Russia and China and these countries which have problems with that. We also made a big contribution to music. Dvorak is considered the founding father of the American classical music. Uh, and his symphony from the New World is uh, one of the most famous pieces of music. Uh, this is about uh, Rhin and uh, Diedrich's country. So they come from Benelux, from the Netherlands and Belgium. They do, uh, they brew best beers in the world, in Belgium. That's without doubts. Yeah, their trappies and Duval are amazing beers. They are pretty good in the soccer as well. They were in the finals of the World Cup as well. Poland, uh, Belgium is probably the best team today. What's interesting about those two countries is they are kingdoms, right? So they have queens and kings, and they do not really suffer from that too much. Okay, and now I'm currently working at the University of California, which is uh, the largest public university in the United States. Our campuses used to be very highly ranked. Uh, Berkeley is CLA, but uh, it seems that we are on the down trajectory in recent year. I guess we are getting too politically correct. Okay, so I want to talk about the hydrous models. So what do hydrous models do? They simulate water flow and solute transport in one, two, and three dimensional variably saturated source. These are numerical models and they are very widely used. So we have thousands of users around the world and there are several thousands of applications which were published in peer review applications. The software consists really of two pieces. One is the public domain code, which is called Hydrus 1D, and that simulates only flow in one dimension, so usually vertical. And as you can see here, the soap profile can be quite heterogeneous, it can be homogeneous, can be quite heterogeneous, and then typical outputs are you know, water contents with depths, pressure at concentration with depths, different fluxes, cumulative actual fluxes, uh, uh, time series of different variables uh, with, at certain depths with time, such as pressure at water contents, etc. And then we have a commercial part, which is called Hydrus 2D 3D. And in this uh, software, we can handle pretty much any types of geometry. So we can handle flow in uh, completely general two-dimensional and three-dimensional geometries. Uh, both models are numerical models. What that means is that we divide the space and time into small pieces in so-called finite elements or finite differences. And then we integrate the governing equations over these uh, smaller pieces to get the overall picture of the flow process. And here you see some examples of 1D, 2D, and 3D domains. Uh, why do we create these models? Well, because they do allow us to very quickly solve the flow and transport equation. They can provide us with insight into the controlling processes and factors. And then we can predict fluxes, different variables. And based on these predictions, we can make some informed management decisions. So both uh, pieces of software can simulate processes in the subsurface. And that means both in the radial zone and saturated zone, as well in, in the capillary fringe, which is the domain between these two zones. And both models can be used at different spatial and temporal scales. So they can be used from the small scales at the lab scale all the way to the field scale. And I can see also some application at the watershed scale, although I don't believe it's appropriate to use these models at that scale because the governing equations are really not, not valid at that large scale. Okay, what are the applications? So uh, the original application for the an original reason for developing these models were agricultural applications. So we simulate or try to account for various hydrological processes around the root zone, including uh, uh, precipitation, evaporation, runoff, irrigation, transpiration, deep drainage, root water uptake, etc. 
And then we can simulate uh, many different types of chemicals from fertilizers, pesticides, fumigants, colloids, nanoparticles, etc. So the model is quite general in terms of dealing with the solute. Uh, there is also a lot of industrial applications which usually deal with various industrial and municipal leaks. One can evaluate the landfill covers, surface covers. One can evaluate various uh, repositories and uh, leaks from the repositories, etc. So there's a lot of industrial applications. And finally, also environmental applications. So the model has the surface energy balance component, uh, which means that it can predict temperature. It can deal with the carbon dioxide transport and flow in the soil. And um, so it can address uh, different uh, pro problems with, associated with the climate change. So the models are based on the three main uh, partial differential equations which I list here in their one-dimensional form. So the first one is so-called Richards equation, and it's an equation which describes variably separated water flow. This equation is highly nonlinear, and that's why we need these numerical models to be able to, be able to solve it. Interesting thing is that L.A. Richards was a scientist at the uh, U.S. Salinity Laboratory in Riverside also. So not only Fang Genuchtan, but also L.A. Richards were both scientists at the U.S. Salinity Laboratory. And he was working there from 20s on until I think like 60s. Then we are solving also solute transport and heat transport equations. These equations are under certain conditions linear, and so they can be solved using analytical, sol analytical solutions. But when we deal with the transient water flow, or when we have some nonlinear processes involved, such as nonlinear sorption or some blocking functions to sorption, then we need to solve these equations using numerical methods as well. So the main processes which the programs can handle is water flow. And so we solve the Richards equation. We can use various models to describe soil hydraulic properties. Obviously, we mostly use the fungi nuctan functions, but we can use other functions as well. We can deal with hysteresis. We can account for the sink term, which can uh, take, uh, which can account for the water uptake by plant roots, which can be either compensated or uncompensated, and which can account for various stresses such as saturation and osmotic stresses. We can also deal with preferential flow, and then finally also with the isothermal and thermal liquid flow. In terms of solute transport, so the standard version of HIRIS can deal with the convective dispersive transport in the liquid phase, as well as diffusion in the gas phase, and then various linear and nonlinear and equilibrium and non-equilibrium interactions between these two phases, which makes the model quite general. Uh, we also deal with the heat transport I already mentioned, and many of our users are using the model uh, in, in the inverse mode when they calibrate the model against experimental data or when they try to inversely estimate parameters governing these systems. From the point of view of solute transport, we can simulate transport of individual ions or single ions as well as particles. And under the group particles, I put all these all things which have certain size, such as colloid, viruses, bacteria, nanocells, nanoparticles, etc. So we, we can deal with that. And then we can also deal with the transport of multiple ions, as long as they are involved in the sequential first order decay. And here you see a couple of examples, radionuclide, nitrogen, species, pesticides, etc. And if we have more complex uh, geochemical system, then we have specialized modules. And in today's presentation, I want to talk mainly about these specialized modules. Okay, both models are supported by quite sophisticated uh, graphical user interfaces. In 1D, it's relatively simple. Here you see the example of the 1D interface and then some applications when we are fitting the breakthrough curve and, uh, and uh, concentration profile. And this involved uh, nanoparticles. And, and then this is a screenshot of the graphical user interface for 2D 
and that's obviously much more sophisticated because you need to deal with uh, spatial issues in both 2D and 3D. We need to have much more complex uh, uh, mesh generators, etc. And here's an example of the 3D geometry. Okay, so now let me focus on these modules, right? So I will deal with the two sets of modules. The first one, which is on this slide, I call like, I don't know, classical, well, old modules, right? So these are modules which we all developed uh, more than five years and some of them more than 10 years ago. What is common for all of these modules is that they simulate flow and transport using the standard hydrants. And then they deal with some specific factor using some external uh, modules or subroutines, et cetera. And so when we coupled hydrous with the Freaksy code, then we can deal with the biogeochemical processes. With the ANSAT CAM code, we can deal with the transport and reactions of major ions and carbon dioxide transport. We have a module which deals with the biogeochemical processes in wetlands. Uh, we have a module which can deal with the particle transport, so let's say colloid transport, and then particle facilitated solid transport, colloid facilitated solid transport. We have also a module which can deal with the preferential flow and non-equilibrium flow. And finally, we develop for EPA a special um, module which can deal with the fumigants. So let me give you some uh, more information about these modules. Show you the time. Okay, so let me start with the freak C. So we, here we use, uh, we call this coupled model HP and then one, two or three, depending on the dimensions. So H stands for hydrous, P stands for freak C. And then we use hydrous to simulate flow and transport um, and heat transport and root water uptake, et cetera, as in the standard module. But additionally, we also included gas transport because uh, for many applications, we need to know carbon dioxide concentrations, uh, oxygen concentrations, et cetera. Right? So those are important inputs for geochemical model. And then we use the Freaksy code, which was developed by USGS, by David Parkhurst and Tony Apello. And that's a very general biogeochemical model, which can consider all these reactions which are listed here. All these reactions can be instantaneous based on thermodynamics, but they can also be dealt with as kinetic, which is a big strength of this module, uh, of this model. Okay, so let me give you uh, two or three simple examples. So first, uh, imagine that you have a salt column, which is initially contaminated with heavy metals, let's say zinc, lead, and cadmium. And then we reach this column with the calcium chloride solution, which means that we will be replacing in the sorption complex the heavy metals, zinc, lead, cadmium, with calcium. And then we will reach these, these, these heavy metals. And so when we run the simulation, the, the Freaksy code will consider all these reactions which are involved within the species, aqueous complexation, cation exchange between heavy metals and, and calcium, et cetera. And then it will give us uh, concentrations uh, at, um, at different locations, at different times. You can get breakthrough curves, et cetera. So it's a quite nice program to give you quite complex uh, results. Uh, this is another application which we did where we simulated uranium transport in agricultural field soils. Uh, this was quite complex simulation because uranium is quite complex species which, uh, which has uh, very complex re reactions with the solid phase. Uh, you can consider both uh, multi-site cation exchange reactions, which would be this one, and you can also consider surface complexation reactions. And you can see that all these reactions depend on the pH. So its pH is variable, this becomes all very complex, right? And this graph shows you the distribution of uranium between these different uh, phases, between liquid phase and solid phase. So you can see that as pH drops below four, the uranium becomes mobile. When the pH is larger than four, then uranium becomes immobile because it's uh, almost 100% soil. 
And so we, we ran these simulations considering all these reactions and we ran that as a, a steady state simulation with the constant flux through the system and then with daily values of precipitation, evaporation, transpiration, etc. So you uh, considering transient conditions in the system. And we ran it for 200 years, so very long simulation. And you can see here from this graph that as the for transient simulation, pH will become quite variable. It'd be changing between 3.4 to 4.2. From this graph, you can see that the mobility of uranium will be quite dramatically different for these different pHs. And then you can obviously expect that we would obtain very different uh, breakthrough at 100 centimeters when we consider steady state, and that means constant pH, or transient simulations, that means variable pH. Uh, another example is this uh, example where I, we simulated uranium transport from mill tailing piles. So we did this example for the IAEA, for International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, where we showed them how these um, bio reactive transport models can be used in these uh, practical applications. And here, as an example, I just show some of the aqueous complexation reactions which are considered in this system. Okay, you can find in the literature quite a lot of papers by now, uh, which use the HP model, mostly HP1. Uh, so there's about 100 papers on different topics, transport heavy metals, uh, radionuclides, we use it uh, to simulate explosives. Uh, interesting applications were also where we were simulating dissolution of concrete. So we simulated hundreds of years of concrete dissolution and how it affected changes uh, in uh, porosities, conductivities, etc. So you can have these feedbacks between reactions and hydraulic properties and can account, let's say, for clogging and um, increase of porosity, reduction of porosity because of precipitation dissolution and so on. So it's becoming quite interesting for them. Okay, another module which I want to mention is the Ansatka module. That was really the first module I developed already some 30 years ago as part of my PhD. And in this model, we again simulate flow and transport, and then in, we simulate carbon dioxide transport and uh, concentrations in the soil, which are a thousand times larger than in the atmosphere, and then also major ion chemistry, right? And this model is a quite simple model compared to the freak C, where you can consider any types of reaction. So this model is limited only to these species, to these reactions, so it considers only the major ions. But there is a lot of uh, practical application for this module, especially in the arid and semi-arid regions where uh, uh, crops are irrigated with waters of different qualities, uh, which can lead to you know, salinization problems. You can use the model to simulate reclamation of sodic soils. Uh, in recent years, the, the module is being used also in fracking industry in mining where this industry generates a lot of uh, produce, saline water, which then need to be disposed of somehow. So it's being blended with the better quality water and used in irrigation. So there is a lot of application for this module. I have only one application which I want to show and that was done in Portugal, where we wanted to show the effectiveness of high risk to simulate fluxes and water contents, but then also concentration of individual cations such as calcium, magnesium, etc. Overall salinity uh, expressed as an EC, uh, sodium adsorption ratio, that's a variable which gives you information about the quality of the water, the quality of the soil, and whether it's going to be impacted by, by processes such as swelling and sh uh, shrinking and um, and clay dispersion and stuff like that, right? And here you see some results in terms of water flow, cations, uh, EC and SAR in different lysimeters, which are very irrigated with water, so different quality. And this was done without any calibration. Everything was measured independently. 
There's a 2D module of this as well. I don't know, go into detail. Okay, the wetland module. That's a very interesting module. It was developed by uh, Ginter Langer Grauber, who took our very sorry, who took our very first uh, Heider scores, which we gave in Germany in 1996, and he was a PhD student developing this module. And so, this module consider reactions and uh, components which are involved in wetlands. Right, so organic matter, nitrogen, different types of bacteria, etc. And there are different types of wetlands. There are wetlands with the vertical flow. So, and those are usually unsaturated. So the processes occurring here are aerobic and anoxic. And then they have horizontal flow wetlands where the conditions are saturated and then the processes may become anaerobic. And because of these two systems are quite different. So we developed two modules. Yeah? One is called CW2D, it's for this vertical flow, and one is CWM1 for the horizontal flow. And this slide shows uh, the, or provides the list of, co uh, of uh, components which are used in these modules. So in both of these modules, we consider oxygen, we consider different pools of organic matter, uh, based on the rates of uh, biodegradation. Then we consider different types of bacteria, heterotrophic, autotrophic, but then also different types of bacteria under uh, anaerobic conditions, then uh, different pools of nitrogen and phosphorus or salt, sulfur. And then we consider all the reactions in, these, uh, in the system between all these components usually described by the Michaelis Menten kinetics. And then we can predict the, what happens in these systems. So it can be used for the natural wetlands, although the applications are mainly for the, for the constructed wetlands from the point of view of designing these systems. And these systems are very widely used in Austria where you know, it's a mountainous country. So they, they build these wetlands to dispose uh, wastewater from um, hotels in, in the mountains and so on. So, so they design them using these codes. Okay, next module is the C ride module, where we simulate particle and particle facilitated solute transport. So what 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 does that mean? Uh, so many contaminants uh, soak very strongly to the solid phase, which means that they should be relatively immobile, right? Based on the absorption, you should be able to calculate the retardation factor. And the retardation factor for radionuclides, heavy metals can be in thousands. So you would say that these chemicals do not move or shouldn't move. But there is still evidence that they can move quite large distances. And the reason is usually, or it's usually that they also attach themselves to colloidal particles such as clay particles and then these colloidal particles provide a vehicle for rapid transport of these contaminants. And so for that, we developed this C ride module uh, where we use hydrous again, and then the C ride deal with the particle transport. So, how this system works? So, in the sol, we have three phases, right? We have water, air, and solid phase. Then we have some mobile colloids, let's say clay particles. And then they can be attached to the solid phase or they can get strained in the smaller pores. They can also attach to the air water interface, which I don't show in this slide. And then mobile colloids usually move quite fast, right? So they have retardation of one, sometimes even lower than one. So they move faster than average pore water ve velocity. And then if we add solute into the system, then the solute is dissolved. It can absorb instantaneously, kinetically uh, to the solid phase, but it can also absorb to these uh, mobile particles. And then these mobile particles provide the vehicle for the rapid transport of these contaminants, such as radionuclides, heavy metals, and so on. And so this C-ride module can deal with this system. I have here one example. Uh, which we did in uh, New Zealand with the Liping Pang. 
where we simulated transport of bacteria using this module, where bacteria were acting as carriers for heavy metals, right? So we had bacteria, so then heavy metals would sorb to the bacteria, and we would simulate the aquifer transport. And the bacteria are relatively large, so they cannot really move very well in, in the soil. But they can move in the fractures, in the larger pores, etc. So they move much faster than the average pore water velocity. And then they can provide a vehicle for very tra rapid transport of these heavy metals. So we published this in, in water resources research, this, this study. Uh, dual permeability mo module deals with the preferential flow. So if you look at the, you know, these different geological conditions, you will never see homogeneous systems, right? Uh, you will always see some uh, fractures, you will see some macropores, some preferential flow pathways. And the, the Richards equation, convection dispersion equations were really not built for these systems. So how do you address this, these more complex systems? So we developed a suite of modules of approaches with uh, Rinfang and Uften, which are based on the dual porosity or dual permeability models. What is the difference between them? So in the dual porosity model, you divide the pore space into two domains, and you assume that water and solute is immobile in one, one uh, part of that domain, and is mobile only in the second part. And that mobile part can be fractures, macropores, etc. while a mobile part may be inside of the soil matrix. On the other hand, dual permeability models, they also divide the system into two domains, but now they consider that water can move and solute in both of these domains, but at different rates. Yeah? So they would move, water would move faster in the macropores, it would move slower in the matrix, but it would be mobile in both of these systems. So we developed kind of suite of approaches of increasing complexity from the uniform flow to dual permeability models, uh, porosity models with mobile and mobile systems to dual permeability models. And those are all implemented into this dual perm module. And this dual perm model I can also consider various chemical non-equilibrium conditions. So it can consider <laughs> excuse me, kinetic sorption, both instantaneous and kinetic sorption, sorption with two different rates, two kinetic rates. This is often used for the transport of bacteria and particles where you can consider one of these sorption mechanisms for attachment, the other sorption mechanism for uh, straining or sorption to the air-water interface, etc. And you can then also have kinetic and instantaneous reactions in mobile and immobile zone when you have these dual permeability porosity systems. This is how it looks like in the Hydra's graphical interface. So you select the model for flow, dual porosity, dual permeability, and then you, you can add to it uh, solute non-equilibrium. And we describe all these models in this paper, which we publish in Radio Zone journal some 10 years ago. Okay, then the fumigant module, uh, I will skip that one. That's uh, it's really applicable mostly in the California, so I will not bother you with that. Uh, one module I want to mention is the highest package for mud flow. Uh, as I mentioned already, I don't believe that the hydrous itself can be used on a really large scale, because the Richards equation is certainly not valid on the scale of the catchment. Uh, but there is a lot of, obviously, technical problems on that scale. So how can we address that? So we, we try to develop a tool which can be used on that scale. And uh, so we developed something which we call Hydra's package for Modflow. If you are familiar with Modflow, you know they have all these different packages which deal with the, the different processes, such as interactions with river, lakes, etc. And so we developed another one, which we call Hydra's package. This was done in really two steps. We started doing this already like 15 years ago in collaboration with Colorado School of Mines, where we implemented 
flow, only water flow. And then last year or two years ago, I had a PhD student from Belgium, uh, Sahila Begum, who also included solute transport and extended it to RT3D, solute transport and that's. So what is the idea here? The idea is that in the subsurface, you can use the water table, that water table divide that system into two parts. Below that, that we have groundwater flow, which is mostly horizontal. And above that, we have an unsaturated zone where flow is mostly vertical. And the process in the, in the vagal zone, which what flow ignores, we can describe using the Hydras model. And Hydras can consider all these processes, which typically does. And then it can calculate what is the recharge at, at the bottom of the Hydras column and provide that information to ModFlow, which then simulate processes in groundwater. And ModFlow will then calculate the position of the water table. And so these two systems are models are exchanging information about the position of the water table and the recharge flux. And we have one ModFlow model, which is then coupled with multiple hydrous verticals representing different parts of this catchment. So here I show a very simple system where I have only two different zones and each of which will be represented by one hydrous vertical, one which is here with the tulip, so obviously Holland, and then another one which is kind of bare, so that's Belgium where the, where the federal government, European government is, right? So where you have these federal bureaucracies, nothing really grows. And so each of these would be represented by one hydrous vertical, and then that's coupled to the whole overall uh, mod flow package. And we tested it on much larger catchments where we had large catchments where we would have you know, land surface elevation, aquifer thicknesses, uh, the boundary fluxes, etc. We would run the how you call it, cluster analysis to identify cells which would be similar. So we would limit the number of these hard hydrous verticals, which are still computationally quite demanding. And then we would have these uh, so-called zones, which would be represented by one hydrous vertical. They would be represented by one average groundwater table, one average recharge flux, etc. And you can see that in this case, we uh, reduce the number of cells in mod flow in one layer from something like three or 400 to, to 20 different zones, which were similar and could be represented by individual hydrous verticals. Okay. Okay. So those are the old modules. Now I want to briefly mention some of the new modules and I will go through it much faster. Uh, all these modules were developed in the last five years, right? And I will skip some of them again. So first one was our collaboration with Jasper Vrucht. I don't know if you know Jasper Vrucht is a, a professor at the uh, University of California in Irvine. And he dedicated his career to developing various uh, global optimization tools, Amalgam module, Dream modules, etc. And so we develop a software package with him, which we call Dream, which can be coupled with Hydras, but can be coupled also with any other other numerical model. The second module, which uh, I want to mention a little bit more, that came with, from the co collaboration with Ning Lu, who is a professor at the Colorado School of Mines, and he's an expert in the soil mechanics. And so what we do here, we simulate transient flow, uh, as usual with hydrous. And then at the same time, we also calculate the soil suction, suction stresses, total effective stresses, and local factor of safety and soil stability, and do soil stability analysis. And so this module exists, it's called slope puke, uh, per slope, stress, and stability, so 3S. And it, it exists in 2D as well as in 3D. So we use hydrus for hydrological information. And then we calculate stress, strain, deformation, and hill slope stability. So it has these engineering applications. Yeah? 
Okay, now I want to mention one person here, Giuseppe Brunetti. So Giuseppe Brunetti is, uh, when I first met him about five years ago, was a PhD student. He took to Hydra's course in Prague. And then I was impressed with him. So I invited him to Riverside for, for six months while he was still a PhD student. And since then, we published over 10 papers and we developed a lot of different new modules. And I will mention four of these new modules now very briefly. So first one was the, the cosmic module. So what is cosmic? Maybe you have heard about the cosmic ray neutron probe. It's a device which can measure water content on the large scale, on the scale of over 100 meter radius, right? Uh, which is obviously goal. You don't want to measure water content at a really small scale at the scale of the samples. For applications, you need this large scale. And so this uh, cosmic ray Newton probe is based on the idea that uh, the Earth is constantly bombarded by, by cosmic rays. These cosmic rays penetrate into the soil and scatter, absor absorb, etc. And some of the neutrons are returned back to the atmosphere where we measure their fluxes using this cosmic ray neutron probe. And their fluxes are directly uh, associated or related to the water content in the soil profile. And so based on these fluxes, we can estimate soil water contents on the large scale. But we can also use this information to estimate effective soil hydraulic properties at that large scale, right? And so for that, we developed this module. The work is based on the work of Jim Shuttleworth, who developed the idea of cosmic ray neutron probes. He also developed a module which calculates the neutron fluxes based on the water content in the soil profile. So he implemented this, uh, this module into hydrous, so hydrous now can calculate these neutron fluxes and can be used in the inverse mode to estimate effective soil hydraulic properties on the large scale. And that was published just recently, last year in the Vedozone journal. And the module can be downloaded from the hydrous website. Okay, then uh, we develop also this module, which we call Ferro which simulate this quasi three dimensional system of ferro irrigation. Yeah, the ferro irrigation is still the dominant way of irrigating crops. Um, it, it, I think something like 60, 70% of irrigation is done by ferro irrigation. And there are not really very good tools at designing this system. So we use hydras again uh, to simulate the subsurface flow. And in addition to that, with Giuseppe, we developed the overland flow module based on the zero inertia flow equation, which simulate flow in the ferro. And then uh, we link that with the, the Hydrus model, so we can have multiple cross section along the ferro, where we simulate based on the condition in the ferro, infiltration into the soil, uh, both at water and solute, and then we can provide that information about the infiltration flux back to the module of the overland flow. And so we, we simplify this 3D system into 1D overland flow and 2D subsurface flow. So this, this was also published just recently in the computers and electronics in agriculture. Uh, and the module is uh, fully available to the public. In addition to the highest standard input, there is only this additional window where we describe the geometry of the ferro, so the slopes, where we describe the inflow, so boundary conditions, and um, we have to provide some modeling characteristic, and then we can calculate infiltrations at different locations along the ferro, the, the recession and advanced fronts, and all this other information. Okay, another application which we dealt with was the ground source heat pump. So I had a uh, well, my former uh, postdoc, uh, Hirotaka Saito, came for sabbatical, and he came with the, with the data from, from the groundwater source heat pump. So what is ground, uh, ground source heat pump? So it's a system where 
uh, we use groundwater as a source of heating and cooling for, for, the, for the buildings, right? So we circulate water in the pipes between the house and ground, ground and subsurface. And so we exchange heat. And so we can use this to heat the buildings in winter and cool them down uh, during the summer. There are different systems, vertical ground source heat pumps, horizontal as well. Well, this is also horizontal, but more complex subsurface structure. So we develop a module for this, the simple one for which we have data, which is a system very widely used in, in Japan. And what we do here, so we simulate uh, heat transport in the pipes up and down. And then we link it again with the Hyder's uh, cross sections at different depths where we simulate the exchange of, of energy between the subsurface and, and, and those pipes. And so we can, based on that, we can design the system, we can take into account, you know, the like uh, factors such as uh, groundwater flow, etc. So this was uh, published in Applied Energy. That was the highest impact paper I ever had in this journal as an impact factor of seven, which no hydrological journal has. Okay, the, the last two applications I want to mention is this dynamic plant uptake module. That's a very interesting application which we work on last year. Uh, the, the plants, they represent the most common pathway for chemicals to enter the human uh, food chain, right? So the plants can take up uh, chemicals from, from the soil if, the, what, if the, the, the plant is irrigated with the wastewater, let's say, but also chemicals can deposit on the plants. And so we are using, again, hydrous model to simulate flow and transport in the subsurface and then the root water and solute uptake. And then we have this module, uh, module which deal with the plants. And we divide the plant into five com uh, components in the, so roots, four, sorry, roots, stems, fruits, and leaves. And each, in each of them, we consider various reactions these chemicals can undergo, such as sorption, metabolization, the plant can grow, which leads to the dissolution of the chem chemical, dilution of the chemical, etc. So it's a very complex system. And so we developed this just recently, published it last year. Uh, we had the data set, one data set on which we already tested it, where we dealt with the uh, chemical carbamazepine, whatever that is. I think it's a bar. Uh, it's a pharmaceutical and how it's being uptaken by different plants, lettuce, spinach, aragua, into roots, shoots, uh, leaves, etc. So we simulate that entire system. The last thing I want to mention, last module, is crop growth. That was always a complaint about hydras that it doesn't deal with the crop growth very well. So there are a lot of attempts in the literature, not only in our group, but other groups where they were coupling hydras with, let's say, Epic, Waffle, SWAT. A lot of that was done in China, so not really by us. Uh, I had a master student, um, uh, Anne Hartmann, who coupled hydras with the root growth model at Jones. So she developed a module where the, the root growth then reflected different stresses in the, the soil. So that's a module which is downloadable from the Hydra website. And also last year I was involved with the team which is developing DSAT, which is the very widely used model simulating crop growth of many different crops. I think they have like 40 different crops. And it was using a tipping bucket approach to deal with the water. And they approached me that they would like to have the Richard base flow in the model. So I provided them with the subroutine, which I dramatically simplified from Hyders. And they implemented these subroutines in the DSAT. And so we published that two years ago, and now we are working on other publications where we are applying this system to different crops. 
Okay, and that's the end of it. So we have a huge number of users, some 50,000 of users. And so we support them using Hydra's website. Obviously, I cannot email with 50,000 users. And so we give them a lot of information on the Hydra's website. We give them tutorials where people can learn how to use the software if they don't want to attend the Hydra's course. We provide them, well, there is a discussion forum where people can ask questions. So there's thousands of questions posted, which is searchable. So the users have, can search it and look for answers or pose new questions. Uh, we list also the uh, publications in which Hydra's has been used. So there's over thousands of uh, papers listed there for Hydra's 1D as well as for Hydra's 2D, 3D. And I'm sure we did a capture all of them because we are not really actively searching that. It's only what I get from, let's say, uh, you know, ResearchGate or something like that. And finally, we also post a lot of examples. So when we publish a paper, we usually also post all the examples, all the simulations on the Hydra's website where people can look at it and, and analyze it, criticize us, etc. And finally, we, we, yeah, so the, there is a lot of these examples and we provide these courses. And there are also some publications where, um, where Hydra's was used. So one of them was written by David Radcliffe, where he wrote the textbooks on soft physics, where we, he uses Hydra's, but also other pieces of software which we developed, such as uh, Stanmold and Red Sea, in explaining the basic concept of soft physics. And last year, we published a book uh, with uh, colleagues in Australia in CSIRO, where, so this is an ebook where we provide a lot of tutorials on the Hydra's 1D, and we, we are in the process of writing something similar also for the 2D and 3D. Okay, and that's all I have. So I hope I didn't go too much over my time. You see, I try to avoid questions. Uh, could you say a few words about how root water uptake is? Uh... Okay, so in, in Hydra's, we are using the macroscopic approach, which was developed by Rainer Fedes. Let me maybe turn on the light here. It's getting, it's getting dark in California. <laughs> okay, so it was developed by, by Rainer Fedes. It's a macroscopic approach. So what we do, we take the uh, potential transpiration. Uh, we need to define where the roots are, what, the, what is the spatial distributions of roots. We distribute this uh, potential transpiration over the root zone. And then we take into account various stresses. We take into account the salinity stress and the saturation stress. And we reduce this potential uptake to get the actual uptake. And then we integrate this actual uptake over the root zone, and that gives us actual transpiration. And uh, yeah, and then we can do various other tricks. We can compensate for the stresses in one part of the root zone by increasing uptake in other parts of the root zone, etc. We can also consider solute transport, which is dealt in a similar way. Uh, we can have a passive uptake. That means that if the chemical is dissolved in the liquid phase, it can be taken up by the roots, which would be used for um, nutrients. Or the chemical can stay behind in the soil, which is how we would deal with the salinity. We can also consider active uptake, where you can say what is the demand of the crop for nutrients. And then we can try to provide uh, that uh, nutrient from, from the soil. So we can account for these processes. OK, so that's about. Thank you. Is there, is there a way to verify all the calculations with measurements in, in this case? Well, sh sure. I mean, root water uptake, that's, uh, that's the, the most common uh, application, right? Uh, the, People obviously measure actual transpirations, and that can be used to verify whether the model deal with that correctly. Yeah, you can deal with the, you can measure ET, let's say using eddy covariance, et cetera, right? And then you can relate 
the prediction of the model, how it reduces potential to actual value, uh, um, whether it's done correctly. There has been obviously a lot of experiments uh, in um, agricultural sciences where they try to account for these various stresses, right? So uh, for the water stress uh, and for the salinity stress, obviously it's US Science Laboratory did a lot of experiments. That's their main, main topic to, to, to provide information how uh, different crops and different plants deal with the stress, whether they are stress, whether they are salinity sensitive or not, right? So okay, thank you. There's a lot of, a lot of information on that. Yeah. Okay. The. Uh, oh, from Ali. Hello, Ali. Uh, spatial temporal scales, right? So I had this one slide about that. Um, so so I I. As I mentioned, I do not believe that the Richards equation is actually valid on the very large scale at the scale of the catchment. And so I wouldn't recommend using Hydra's models on that scale. Uh, obviously, the Richards equation is a local equation because it's highly nonlinear. So you cannot do what you do typically in mod flow that you have one point here, another point 100 meter away, and then you simply calculate the gradient and multiply it by conductivity. That might work in the saturated zone, but that obviously doesn't work in the unsaturated zone when the conductivity is the function of saturation, et cetera. So I, uh, there are obviously papers in the literature where they apply Richards-based model for the catchment and for the whole continents, and I will not mention who publishes these papers. I don't believe it's scientifically correct or mm. scientifically honest. That's my opinion. And um, the, the way we try to deal with that is that approach which I presented that the hydrous package for mod flow. Yeah. I, I believe that you cannot really solve the Richards equation if you do not use discretization on the orders of centimeters. You cannot go into the, the discretization of meters. And then if you want to uh, discretize the catchment, you have millions of nodes. So I, I, that's my opinion, okay? And I, I hope it answered that question. And, and, and our approach would be that Hydra's package for Modflow. We have just recently published a paper where we applied this on the large scale, where we simulated uh, uh, transport of uh, pesticides on the, on the catchment scale using this, this Hydra's package for Modflow. And it was published in, the, in Water, Water Open Access Journal. Yeah, yeah, actually, I like the idea of the combining the mother flow and hydros because my yeah. mother flow cannot deal with the unsaturated zone. And probably this looks like some kind of free surface approach and recharge from hydros is much more makes sense and also deal with the large scale problem. Um, okay. With more, yeah. okay, thank you. So what is the typical execution time, say, for uh, oh. area? You are not getting me. I have never run that model, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, obviously, it, it takes longer, right? Because now we are simulating, let's say, 20, maybe 100 vertic hydras, 1D verticals. But with the hydras, we can do the seasonal simulation on, on the orders a few seconds, yeah? And so, so it will go into the, the, the hours. But I have to admit that I have never actually run that model. It was always done by Sahila or my students. Yeah. Okay. Can 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 Hydra's uh, model uh, by models? I guess soil soil water retention curves. Yeah. Yeah. So in in Hydra's, I can actually open it right right here. Just the one D. 
make it simple. Uh, so you can select different, uh, yeah, it's too small. But you, you can select different models to describe salt water retention curve. You can have fun Genuktan, Moala model. You can have modified model. You, uh, you can have Brooks and Corey model. You can have Kosugi model. So those are all uni model uh, the description. But you can also have the model by Wolfgang Durner, which is by model. Okay. So does the lookup table option is just you know, from the experimental data? You can, uh, yeah, that can come from the experimental data. Okay. Now, you know what, recently the, the retention curves are very often measured this hype prop me method, right? Using the ev evaporation method. And that method will provide you very high quality data for uh, from which you can derive these dual porosity models for both flow and conductivity. Yeah. And one more question, so probably asked uh, from Omar. So can hydros be suitably applied for basement discontinuous area where the water table is not continuous? So it's like more fracture or... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I uh, well. I don't know why not, right? Yeah. It, it solves the Richards equation, right? So, mm -hmm. so and it, it actually solves it on, on both, uh, in the both saturated and unsaturated zone. So uh, there is no reason why there, there couldn't be part saturated, part unsaturated, and other part saturated. We certainly did have applications where we simulated like perch water. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I have never published anything like that because those, those are more consulting applications, right? We simulated uh, transport of MTBE in the Santa Monica uh, mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the gasoline stations, right? And how they polluted groundwater. And so that, there were multiple layers of perch um, systems which we simulated with hydras. So it, in vertically, we certainly done that. I don't know. Horizontally, I can't even imagine how, how that would look like. Okay. So as long as you can assign permeability and other full sure. type of structure, yes, you can solve it. Yeah, if you have a heterogeneous system, right? If you have some clay layers, less permeable, you can create the perch okay. system. Yeah. And is the, that... last, the last yeah. question is to Ali. Ali, so about the density driven flow. Uh, no, we don't have that in, in the standard version of Hydras, yeah. Um, so I, I, I do have my own version which where we implemented this option, but it's not in the, that version which is publicly available. The same is for the storage coefficient in the saturated zone, right? So in the standard package which is available to the public, we assume it's zero in the saturated system. But uh, uh, with Ali, we actually did put uh, some 20 years ago, I think, uh, I collaborated with him and we put this uh, storage coefficient in, into the hydras, but we never released it to, to the general public. And I recall we did some simulation with that, but I do not recall actually how, how, how successful it was or not. And the same is for the, the density dependence. So no, we, we don't have it in the standard version of the code. Okay. So do you answer any other questions? Now maybe my last question is, that, do you have module available for some remediation problem or like cleanup, groundwater cleanup or bay dose junk cleanup problem, like optimizing pump and treatment or bioremediation, ED injection or something like that? No, we don't have a specialized module on that. Mm -hmm. But if, if the processes are considered in the code, right, like sorption, kinetic sorption, um, immobile zone, you know, and then diffusion from the immobile zone to the mobile zone, if there is flow around it, I'm sure you can apply that to such an mm -hmm. application. But we, we don't have any specialized module. No. Okay. Okay. Uh... If you don't have any more questions, and well, then yeah. I would like to thank you again for okay. 
in inviting me to give the presentation and to listening to me especially. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, again uh, accepting our invitation and so we'll contact you for review of the your uh, presentation in our yeah. website recording. Yeah, when we recover from this pandemic, I'm sure I will come to visit okay. you either privately or <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Look forward Thank to you. seeing you in uh, person, and maybe we can find out more about the uh, Czech beer and uh, compare it with the Belgian beer. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we always claim Czechs always claim that the Czech beer is the best, and we are the the highest. We consume most of it per, per capita, right? But I I I do have to admit that some of the Belgian beers are amazing. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But we have also the, the highest positivity of the coronavirus right now in the world, in Czechia, because uh -huh. people just can't stop drinking and going to the pubs. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why we'll have to wait a while for that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Yeah? That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Bye. So we'll contact you later okay, for the uh, video review and other documents. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.